Well, good afternoon. It's George Lemieux from the Gunster Law Firm. We're here with Senator Marco Rubio on our View from the Top uh, videocast. Senator, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Great to be with you. Love to see you wearing that Dolphins gear. Uh, wish yeah. we were talking about the Fins today. Um, well, at least we had some live sports last week for a few hours of the draft, so that was good. Goodness, right? Hopeful times, at least for the Dolphins. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for what you did with the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, I think it's the most important piece of legislation any Florida member of Congress has ever done, and I know you were the author of that as the chair of the Small Business Committee. Can you talk to us about sort of how that happened, what your thinking was, and then give us a little sense of how it's going? Yeah, no, we started working on general ideas about it, you know, weeks in advance, sort of anticipating some level of disruption and really thinking about how small businesses could be a part of the supply chain because we saw some shortages on the way. And then this thing just, you know, snowballed into the reality that some of these places were going to have to shut down. So it really started as a how do we protect small businesses in a way so they have money to keep people on payroll. And then we were asked to bring additional people on board. So create uh, a category of exemption so you could allow more restaurants and, and uh, hotels in because they were the first ones hit. You know, they, that's the industry that's the first in, and they're going to be the last ones out of this downturn. And then we were asked to take on 1099 employees and then the C, C3 sector. So bottom line is it became much bigger than just about small business, although that remains the core of it. And I think the, the program has been bipartisan. That's, I think that's why you've seen – you don't see a lot of pol politicians out there harping about it. Every word in that law – was agreed to by both sides without much controversy. And we're in the middle of the second round as we're recording this, but I think when all is said and done, we're gonna be able to say that 60 to 70 million American jobs, the payroll for 60 to 70 million Americans was covered for six to eight weeks as a result of the program. But I can tell you there's probably another 20 or 30 million more uh, that are in need of this. And so my sense is that there's gonna be growing pressure to come back and, and replenish that fund, maybe by tightening the qualifications a little bit narrowing the scope of it but nonetheless trying to help more of those who are left out do you think that there will be a third round of funding to add so that folks can apply or able to get in the first two yeah i think there will be i think the question really becomes uh, how long does it take to get to that point there is some sentiment out there that we should take a pause to see how what we've done is working um, the counter to that which i would argue is that if you're a small business out there who's trying to figure out who to hold on to and who to let go you don't have time for that sort of pause I think the longer it takes, the more that third round will be more about recovery and less about payroll protection. And I think we've learned some lessons as a result of rounds one and two that we would want to see. So we've already started working on some of those ideas. We're going to have a broader discussion next week when we get back to Washington. But I can't tell you about the timing. Uh, obviously, the House will not be in session next week. Well, again, thank you so much, because I think the, the general government response and things like this is send money to people. And that's fine, and that's helpful, and you all did that too with the uh, CARES Act. But to be able to send it to the businesses so that the businesses could keep people employed and try to stand up again, I think, was really, really critical. So thank you again. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. It, it, we wanted to keep workers attached to their employers as much as possible uh, because, obviously, that's going to help those businesses restart faster. It's also a lot less disruptive than having to try to go on some website and qualify for a unemployment check, which for a lot of people is devastating. Many people have never been unemployed in their lives. Right. So uh, you talked about Congress maybe coming back. And, you know, what do you, what do you think could be besides the putting more money into Triple P, you know, what else could their Congress anticipate, do you think, doing? Is there going to be another, is there going to be a CARES Act too? Uh, what else yeah. might Congress do this year? Well, I think clearly at some point there'll have to be efforts on recovery. So how do we recover from the damage that's been done, at which we still don't know the full extent of, but it's obviously going to be very dramatic and unprecedented. But I believe that there'll be an interim step between recovery and response, and, and I think there's probably going to be need for at least a third response iteration. And clearly, at the end of the day, I think it'll involve something like uh, litigation reform, some way to figure out how to protect businesses who are afraid to reopen because they could be sued out of existence. If someone comes and says they were infected there, some there, you know, I know there's a lot of back and forth going on about this, but cities and counties, uh, local governments in particular, are facing some pretty tight constraints. And when you start to see people furloughed, you know, your sanitation department, potentially police, fire, and other, you know, building construction stops because people can't pull permits, there's going to be a lot of pressure. So I'm, I don't think we should be bailing out uh, governments that made bad spending decisions and have their upside down their pension fund. 
but I do think in terms of providing for loss of revenue is something that we're going to have to look at as part of all this. And there's been some talk about can we put something additional for frontline workers who have been going to work 18, 20 hours a day. There's been some talk about that. And I would imagine more investment in the research necessary to develop a vaccine and to make faster, better testing more widely available as well. Well, those would all be good things. And what you said about you know, protecting uh, businesses, I mean, it was something that we're getting asked all the time at, at Gunster here is, you know, when I reopen, how do I reopen? Am I going to get sued by my customers if someone gets sick? What are the right safety protocols to follow? And there's just, you know, people try to follow industry standards and guidelines from governments, but, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about that. And we want these businesses to open, so I'm glad that you're going to address that. Yeah, there's a balance there. You know, I mean, we don't want to excuse or protect gross negligence and things of that nature. I mean, look, if you're an employer, you know that you're infected or someone around you is and you're allowing them to infect other people. That's one thing. But if someone says, look, I went to eat at your restaurant a month ago and I gave and I got COVID-19 as a result of it and I lost all these wages. That's a tough one. I mean, because you theoretically can't prove that that's where you picked it up. And even if you did, I mean, it's sometimes it's an unavoidable situation. You can't we don't have the capacity to test everyone that walks in. So it's a tough issue. You know, and a lot of it will be under state law. I mean, you're going to file these claims under state law, not federal law. So that also limits the uh, you know, federal government's ability to, to do something about that. No, I think you have the balance right there. Let, let me ask you a little bit about China. Um, obviously, this disease starts in China. A lot of concern about how it spread, the transparency of the Chinese government, but also the fact that we're so dependent upon China for so many things from medicine to manufacturing. You've been very vocal on this topic and have been vocal on foreign affairs issues with China for a number of years. Uh, give us a sense of where you think this discussion is going. What would you would like to see? Well, I think there's three things we want to focus on. The first is that um, this is an example of why authoritarianism is bad. You know, in any other country, let's say that that, let's say that, that outbreak would have happened in Australia. What would have happened is they would have revealed that this is what we know so far. They would have invited countries from all over the world and experts to come in and help them figure it out. They would have been transparent about it. Now, they would have gotten criticism. It would have been messy. But that's what democracies have to do. In China, they were aware they had a problem, and they tried to silence the people that were out there saying it. In fact, one of the first doctors to talk about it was forced to sign a document in which he pledged never to speak about this again. He ended up, of course, losing his life on the 30th of January as a result of all this. So that was a big deal, because had they been able to act quicker, they could have probably constrained it geographically. But the nature of an authoritarian regime is to try to cover up the truth and keep people from knowing about it. And that, along with other things they did to force countries to continue to accept flights from China, helped spread this globally. I think the second piece of it all is what you've alluded to, and that's supply chains. And that's a pre-existing issue. This is not about protectionism for the sake of protectionism. It is about identifying in the 21st century what are critical industries to our security, our health, our national uh, military security, and so forth. And, and do we have a domestic or allied capacity to provide it in a time of crisis? Because if the answer is no, then you are vulnerable to an, uh, an adversary denying you these things in a moment of conflict. And this is goes well beyond the personal protective equipment and swabs for a test. I'm talking about rare earth minerals, which you need in order to be able to do anything technological. So there's a, there's a lot to talk about and unpack there. And I, and I think that many countries in the world are making the same realization right now. And you're going to see a growing move towards protecting those. And I think the third thing, and it goes back to the first point, is if you look at the world, the answer, the way this crisis will end at some point will be with the development of a vaccine. And the way we're going to make it better in the interim is to the development of better testing and, and things of that nature. All of that is going to come out of the free nations of the world. It, the, the, things, the, the answers to this problem are going to be developed by a combination of transparency and accurate data, partnerships between government and civil society, and ultimately the collaboration that leads to scientific and technological advances that allow us to uh, rapidly trace this disease, try to treat it through advances in therapeutics, and ultimately prevent it through a vaccine. All of that will be a product, in my view, of free countries. Um, and, and so I think that's a really important thing to point to as we move forward. No, that's very well said. Let me just have us end with this. We're starting to talk about reopening. Governor DeSantis yesterday put out some guidelines for reopening at least parts of Florida. Give us a sense of what you think May, June, July look like in the state of Florida. Well, you know, it's hard to tell, and a lot of that depends on what happens with the infection rate. But I think a couple things have to be in place, and I, that's why I believe the, the way he's doing it now is, is wise. Number one is you have to have 
enough surveillance testing, almost like taking a daily poll to sort of give you a geographic sample of what's really happening. Can't wait for people to get symptomatic and show up at the hospital to have a real good insight into what's happening with the disease. I think the other thing we have to do is sort of ask ourselves, what is the goal here? If the goal is to have zero new infections, that's not a realistic goal because as long as there's no anti as long as there's no vaccine or immunity, you're going to have infections. The key is, can you keep the infection rate slower enough so it doesn't undermine the, uh, and destabilize the healthcare system and save lives, of course, in the process? And and so I think you're starting to see some some of the gradual reopening. You know, he he's taking the three phases that the CDC has put out, and then he's modifying it. So he went to a phase one in 64 out of 67 counties, but he didn't uh, include movie theaters in that as an example. So he's going to modify it for Florida purposes. They're going to see how it works, and they're going to wait a few weeks to move to phase two. And then he's giving a lot of flexibility to local governments to be more restricted. I want to say, for example, in Miami-Dade County, one of the three counties not included in the 67, I think uh, Mayor Jimenez has done a great job in terms of easing into it, he started to make some slight openings, but nothing overly dramatic. But I think he thinks in about eight to 10 days, we could be at a phase one type situation. So it's gonna be gradual. But the one thing I'm pretty confident in saying is, it's not gonna be the way it was on March 1st or March 12th uh, for a while. You're, we're still gonna have to be six feet apart. You're still gonna have limits on how many people can get together. There are a lot of things that are gonna change and, and it's still gonna have a deep societal and economic cost attached to it. Well. We are, we are hopeful uh, and we're thankful to you for what you did with PPP and you continue to represent us so well in Washington thank on you. these issues. And um, thank you so much for being on our view from the top at the Gunster Law Firm and appreciate you being here today. Thanks. Stay safe, everyone. Okay. Take care.